Hello, and welcome back to the second season of Off the Deaton Path. My name is Stan Deaton with the Georgia Historical Society, and we welcome you to this podcast for the week of October 1st, 2018. We're starting out this new season with a very special guest, my friend and historian John Furling. John is one of the premier historians of the American Revolution, ranking right up there with David McCulloch, Gordon Wood, and Joseph Ellis, whose books you no doubt see when you go into the bookstore. John is an emeritus professor of history at the University of West Georgia. He is the author of 14 books altogether on the early American period, including he has written nine in the last 18 years on the Revolutionary Era. And in addition, he is the author of biographies of Washington and Adams. And I won't list all of his books here, but I have reviewed two of John's books on my blog. And here's what I wrote about him, uh, in particular, writing about his book, Jefferson and Hamilton. I said, quote, There are many good comprehensive histories of the Revolution, but the best place to start, in my opinion, is two volumes by John Furling. One is A Leap in the Dark, The Struggle to Create the American Republic, which was published by Oxford University Press in 2003, is the best political history of the year 1750 to 1800. Furling's companion volume, Almost a Miracle, The American Victory and the War of Independence, published in 2007 by Oxford University Press, covers the military conflict, and again, in my opinion, there is no better military history of the war available today. Here's what I wrote on the flyleaf of the book when I finished it. Quote, a first-rate book, the best one-volume history of the war to this point. Furling's best work yet, probing analysis of leaders, campaigns, and issues on both sides. Its final summary chapter is the best account available of why the British lost and the Americans won, as is his summation of Washington. Unquote. Now, among his other books is a group biography of Washington, Adams, and Jefferson entitled Setting the World Ablaze, a study of the pivotal election of 1800 entitled Adams vs. Jefferson, a political history of George Washington called The Ascent of George Washington, a volume on Jefferson and Hamilton, and also one called Independence, The Struggle to Set America Free. They're all good, all well worth reading. John's latest book is entitled Apostles of Revolution, Jefferson, Payne, Monroe, and the Struggle Against the Old Order in America and Europe, published in 2018 by Bloomsbury. I sat down with John Furling to talk about his latest book, The Founders, and their place in contemporary American society when he was in Savannah for a GHS program. This is the first of two parts, and it was recorded at the Planters Inn in Savannah on September 13th of this year. I hope you enjoy it. John Furling. John Furling, welcome to the podcast. Uh, thank you, Stan. I appreciate you being here. You, uh, you and I have known each other almost 20 years. I met you 18 years ago in 2000. You came down to Savannah to give a lecture on your book, Setting the World Ablaze, and you have written nine books since that one, uh, including that one. In those 18 years, you wrote books before that one on the era of the American Revolution. I am curious to know what it is about the period of the American Revolution that you still find so fascinating. This is ground that you continue to plow. Okay, well, that's, uh, I think there's, there are many uh, things that fascinate me about it. One is that this is when the nation was founded, and so decisions are made or come out of the American Revolution uh, that will shape things for generations uh, unborn at, at that time period. Including our time period. I mean, we, we're still living under a constitution uh, that was uh, written and ratified during the American Revolution and uh, that, in some respects, contained things that uh, perhaps grew out of the American Revolution. And, but also, uh, I think I, I'm fascinated by the fact that when I give talks, uh, there, there are many misconceptions about the American Revolution, that some people feel that the revolution is over in 1776, independence is declared and, and that's it, uh, when in fact I think the revolution goes on into the 19th century. And oftentimes in my talks I'll, I'll carry the story of the revolution down through Jefferson's election in 1800. You could go beyond that of course, but uh, I carry it down to, to that, that point, and sometimes people in, in audiences are flummoxed 
and ask, what am I doing talking about the 1790s? I thought this was going to be a talk about the American Revolution. Uh, so I, I, I think that that, that that fascinates me. People oftentimes uh, are, they don't really realize that there was a war in the South uh, during the American Revolution. They may be aware of, of Bunker Hill and and uh, Trenton and uh, or, uh, Washington, uh, Washington's campaigning in uh, New York, and uh, but they're they're not really aware that there was a long war in the South, and in many respects, you could argue that the um, uh, that the war was won in the in the South, and there are misconceptions about many of the people. Who were involved in the in the the revolution? And j just this week, I got an email from uh, a woman that I don't know, but she grew up in the same town that I grew up in 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 Texas, and uh, she had seen me on C-SPAN's Q and A and and learned that I grew up in Texas City, Texas. So she wrote me, and she was talking about her love of the American Revolution and mentioning people like Washington and John Adams and on and on and on, uh, but never said anything about just the common people in the Revolution who were uh, uh, impacted by it. And that's one of the things that I've, I've tried to, uh, to talk about in the books that, that I've written, that, the, that just ordinary people, men and women, uh, were were impacted by the, the the revolution. So, Wendy, you you mentioned the era of the revolution, and that some of the time, some of the when you give a talk, sometimes you go beyond what people traditionally think of as the era of the American Revolution. I would ask you, when do you consider the revolution to have ended? When, when would you mark the end of the era of the of the revolution? Uh, well. Um, I'm not sure I can actually put a date on it, but certainly after 1800, the country is democratizing, uh, uh, and and by 1830, uh, uh, you have universal manhood suffrage exists almost everywhere uh, in America. Uh, uh, but even beyond that, I think. Uh, people who were involved in the anti-slavery movement, and I mean, many things shaped them, but among the things that shaped their thinking was the Declaration of Independence and the idea that that the inalienable rights for everybody, all, all people, uh, included life, liberty, and pursuit of happiness and, and the notion of the equality of, of humankind. So that, that in a sense, the revolution shaped the anti-slavery movement, but it also s uh, shaped uh, the struggle uh, for workers in the late 19th century who were exploited and, and victimized. And it shaped people who were involved in the civil rights movement. When, when Martin Luther King talks about, I have a dream in his most famous speech, I mean, he, he's in effect saying, I have a dream that African Americans will uh, be cut in on the American dream that was expounded by Jefferson in the Declaration of Independence. And feminists from the 19th century into the 20th century were influenced by the rhetoric of the, of the Declaration of Independence. So in one sense, I think the American Revolution never ended. It's ongoing. Yeah. That's what I hear you saying. Yeah. This is a revolution that really is at the heart of who we are as right. a people. Um, we're going to talk specifically about the book that brings you to Savannah that you've just recently published with Bloomsbury. It's entitled Apostles of Revolution, Jefferson, Payne, Monroe, and the Struggle Against the Old Order in America and Europe. Uh, specifically, I want to ask you first, though, you're dealing with a group of people who are sort of enshrined in the eternal American Hall of Fame as the founders. Uh, two questions about them. Did they think they were extraordinary in the way that we do now today? We look back and see them, capital F, founding fathers. Did they see themselves as being extraordinary? Um, and secondly, do you think that they 
are extraordinary. Do you think that they have perhaps earned the title of the greatest generation, uh, particularly at least in the 18th century? What do you think about this group? Yeah, yeah I, I, I think uh, they understood that they that that the this rebellion against England was uh, a significant event in history that it was an extraordinary event and that that they were playing a part in an extraordinary event uh, John Adams for example really never saved uh, his correspondence or his papers until he goes to Congress in 1774 and he writes home to Abigail and he says from now on I'm I'm going to preserve my papers and uh, we don't know if Jefferson felt that way or not because a fire destroyed the home that he grew up in Shadwell and most of his papers were were lost so he only begins uh, saving papers after I think it was 1772 or so but he seems to save uh, more of his papers after he goes to Congress in 1775. So I think they, they, they certainly felt that they were involved in something that was extraordinary. Whether they thought they were ex- extraordinary or not, they, they don't, none of them that I'm aware of say that, but they wouldn't have been inclined to, uh, to, to say that. And they all had ups and downs. Uh, one of the things that I, I wrote about in um, in Apostles of Revolution is that Jefferson and Payne and Monroe all play important roles in the in the American Revolution. Jefferson is in Congress. Payne writes Common Sense and the American Crisis. Monroe, who's only 18 years old in 1776. Uh, has a different experience, but he soldiers for several years during the Revolution, is wounded at Trenton, and was fortunate to survive uh, that wound. An artery was severed by the ball that he took in in his chest. And so all of them um, reached something of an extraordinary stature in the course of the Revolution, but by the time the Revolution ends, all of them have sort of fallen from from that stature. Uh, Jefferson has a, a really difficult uh, governorship of Virginia. He's governor for two years uh, as a war governor. Maybe no other governor in America uh, had as uh, all of the trials and tribulations that Jefferson uh, faced as as a war governor because the British were invading. Virginia at that time. He made decisions that were controversial, one or two that were probably bad decisions. And he, uh, when he leaves office, I mean, the, the general view in Virginia is his political career is probably over. And Jefferson seemed to think that it was over too. He, he goes back home and he says, I'll never again hold office. I don't want to hold office any longer. And he may have stuck with that, uh, except that his wife died uh, in 1782, I think it was, and then after that he's adrift and he does go back into public life. But, but And Payne, uh, 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 during the last uh, couple of years of the Revolution, had a position as a secretary to a congressional committee on foreign relations and he made the mistake of revealing something uh, that he found in a secret document and the French minister to the United States got bent out of shape, to put it mildly, uh, that he had done that. And so Payne's foes in Congress ganged up on him. And he, he of course, had made enemies because of things that he, he had written and he got fired from that, that position. And he was he was so distraught by that that he said at the time, I, I went back to my apartment and I didn't come out for 60 days. He was just in a deep depression. And he kind of turns against Philadelphia and against America. And not too long after that, he leaves and doesn't come back to America for, for 25 years. But I think he saw just no, no future here. And he felt as though he had been betrayed by the Americans that he he had served. And Monroe uh, tried and tried to get a field command 
in the army, he couldn't get one, he comes back to Virginia, he couldn't even get a high-ranking uh, position in the Virginia Continental Line, and so he's not soldiering at the time of Yorktown, he's practicing law in Fredericksburg and he misses out on, uh, uh, on a chance to win glory at Yorktown, so that that um, none of them at the end of the American Revolution was was exalted, and uh, their their stature only begins to rise because of things that happen after the war. Mm-hmm. You uh, you focus on three people in this book: Thomas Jefferson, Thomas Paine, James Monroe. Um, Jefferson obviously needs no introduction to any audience um, of people who are interested in American history. Well-known. You've written about him. In fact, by my count, this is the fourth book you've written <laughs> with his name in the title. Um, and yet you always manage to find new things to say about him. Um, so talk to me for a minute about, first of all, let's talk about Thomas Paine. Uh, he's not well-known, probably should be better known. I think he's an extraordinary individual. Um, I have read his Age of Reason, which is an extraordinary document, and, and I think took intellectual courage to write then and still would today. But give our, give our listeners, if you will, a few minutes and, and introduce them to Thomas Paine, why you wanted to write about him, and what is so extraordinary about him. Yeah, I, I think Paine should be regarded as one of the founding fathers. I, I think probably most people agree on five or six people uh, who who are in that pantheon, Washington and Franklin and John Adams and uh, Jefferson and uh, Madison Hamilton. and Hamilton. Mm-hmm. Uh, th- those would be, I, if I didn't count them, what was a six? I, I think guess. it's six, yeah. Well, I would put a seventh <laughs> in there, and that, that would be uh, pain. Um, I, I, I'm sympathetic to pain, I guess, for... Uh, several reasons, but but one is that I come from sort of the same kind of background that Payne came from in the sense that Payne came from a working class background. I came from a working class background. My dad was a hard hat who worked in a petrochemical industry uh, down on the Gulf Coast of Texas, and that that's where I was raised. And uh, Payne uh, uh, his dad was a staymaker, a craftsman in Thetford, England, which was a little market town about 50 miles outside of uh, London. And Payne grows up uh, like almost every uh, child of a craftsman in 18th century England. Um, he's going to be a craftsman too. That's that's the only choice. And he wanted something else. He didn't know what he wanted. He just knew that he wanted something else. And I, I felt the same way when I was growing up. I, I knew I didn't want to be a pipe fitter uh, at a petrochemical industry, uh, but I didn't know what I, I wanted to do. And for me, going to college was really the transformative experience of my life. It just opened all, all sorts of doors. And pain goes to London uh, when he's 21, 22 years old, and it's the transformative experience of his life, I think. When he's in London, uh, he begins to attend talks that are given on all kinds of things. He, he was very interested in science, and he goes to talks on scientific matters, but he also goes uh, and hears people give political talks, and he gets introduced to the English reform movement in that uh, uh, way and and one of the clubs that he goes to uh, was a club that Benjamin Franklin uh, attended and it met on a weekly basis and he began to hear uh, the ideas of the Enlightenment and a political reform and uh, uh, just a variety uh, of of things. So so it's fair to say he's self educated. Right. Oh yeah. He he. I think he had maybe five or six years of formal education. He said he wasn't a very good student. He just wasn't very serious about it. That he did pretty well in science and math, but he wasn't very interested in 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 other subjects. And then he he winds up when he's thirty seven years old. He's at a dead end. He he's lost his job. He's been fired. He was a tax collector. 
uh, of all things, and he gets fired from that position, and he's just at a dead end. And I think he probably goes to Franklin and tells Franklin, who was uh, the son of a craftsman and a craftsman himself uh, when he was a young man, uh, that he wants to come to America, and Franklin writes a letter of recommendation uh, for him, and, and, and Payne comes over in 1774, and he begins to write, and I write too, so I, I feel sort of a kindred spirit with, with Payne in, in that regard. And he writes Common Sense, which really, I think, uh, is, is the first really open attack on monarchy. Even in the, the English reform movement that influenced him, most of their emphasis was on reforming parliament. They, they, they shied away from attacking the monarchy. Uh, but Paine attacks the monarchy, and I think once, once that pamphlet just becomes so extraordinarily popular in America, the idea of going back to a monarchy is just not politically uh, feasible. Do we have any idea, do you have any idea, where he learned to write like that? Because his style of writing was very different at that period. It was more aimed, I think, at the common man. Yeah. And, and do we have any idea how he learned to write like that? Uh, not really, I don't think. He, 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 when he was a tax collector, the tax collectors kind of organized and uh, they, they organized around the idea of getting a pay raise and they had to petition Parliament. And somehow or other they chose Payne, who had not written anything previously to write their appeal. And I think he learned that he, he could write uh, as a result of that. But that's, that's the only thing that we know. He never, never discussed it. But we do know that, that most of the people who wrote pamphlets uh, in during the course of the protest against Britain between 1765 and 1776, most of them were lawyers, and they were they were extremely well educated college graduates, and um, they they would tend to drop in lots of Latin phrases and whatever, and they they wrote really for an audience of well educated people, and Payne, who was not well educated. I think aimed his writing, as you mentioned, at sort of the common man, the common person uh, out there, and and really strived in everything that he wrote to to write in such a manner that an an ordinary person who was literate but not terribly well educated could read and understand what he was saying, and I think that's what made Payne such a good writer. But how he wound up with that, I, 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 can't, I can't say. It's something of a mystery. Um, so all three of these, um, Monroe, Jefferson, and Payne, uh, as apostles of revolution, you, in your book, spend a lot of time, obviously, on the American Revolution, but we're also talking here about the French Revolution. And Thomas Paine, probably more than any of these three, Jefferson was on hand in 1789 when the revolution broke out. Uh, Paine, I think, arrived shortly after that and not only witnessed it, but he was dropped right into the middle of it, as he usually did. He found his way into the center of controversy, and he almost lost his life in the French Revolution. Is that right? That's right. He, uh, Payne had gone over to France in 1788. Mo most people don't realize it, but because of his scientific background, he, he was interested in building an innovative uh, type of bridge, uh, in the 1780s, and in fact, he he began working on it while he was still living outside of Philadelphia. But he he just couldn't find the financial backing in America. I mean, the, America was in economic straits at the end of of the war, and Franklin, Benjamin Franklin, uh, encouraged him to go to Paris and submit his ideas to the Academy of Science there and see if they would would back him and so he he goes over and arrives uh, in in late 1787 I, I think it was and I, I think what Payne was doing there is I mean he, he did want to succeed as a bridge uh, builder but I think he was hoping that he could become the next Benjamin Franklin that he he sees himself 
um, like Franklin as the son of a craftsman who had been a craftsman himself. He had been a staymaker for a couple of, of years. And that uh, he's hoping that he can succeed in uh, a scientific endeavor. I mean, so much of the Enlightenment is about science. It is really the dawn of the age of, of science. And he wants to be seen not, not only as a political activist, but as a, as a man of science, too, as, as was Jefferson, as was Franklin and, and others. And, and that would really cap his, his reputation. But anyway, he, he, uh, he, he, and when the French Revolution breaks out, he's back in England, and he's working on that bridge and trying to get it accepted in England. Then he goes back over on several occasions uh, to from England to to France. Uh, sometimes he he just goes over as a representative from America in some commemorative parade to commemorate the anniversary of the battle of, of the of the fall of the Bastille, uh, for example. But then in 1792. Uh, during the French Revolution, they're going to to move to a new national assembly that's going to be called the National Convention, and um, the the existing Parliament named 20 foreigners as French citizens. Uh, there were, f I think, four Americans who were named as uh, honorary citizens. Payne was not one of them. Washington was. Ha Hamilton was one of them. Uh, but Payne, and then there were several English uh, people who were named as honorary French citizens. And Payne, since he had grown up in England, was named as, a, as, an, uh, as an Eng one of the English. And so he comes back. He, he's not only named to that, but Calais, uh, the town of Calais, elects Payne as a, it's one of its delegates to the National Convention. So he comes back to take his seat in the National Convention. And the idea of the convention, when, it's, when it is established, is it's going to write a constitution for France. And uh, by that time, the king has tried to flee. It's going to be a constitution that may may eliminate the French monarchy altogether, probably will, and Payne wants to be a part of that. So he's, he serves in the National Convention, and that puts him right in the maelstrom, as it turns out, of the Reign of Terror in 1794 in France. And he's arrested. He's thrown into prison in the Luxembourg prison. He spends 10 months in the Luxembourg prison and was ticketed uh, for the guillotine. And really, the, the only two things saved him. One was he fell desperately ill. He probably had typhoid fever. It's not clear what, what malady he had, but he was quite fortunate uh, to survive. I, I think there were a couple of doctors who were in the prison, also incarcerated in the prison, and they knew enough to keep him hydrated and I think that was what kept him going during that that crisis. But he, by the the the, the national tribunal, um, had had moved to bring pain before the tribunal, which would have probably uh, put him right on the on the guillotine once once he his hearing took place, and he was too ill to to go before the tribunal, and the and. That delayed things for a while, and during that delay, Robespierre, who was running things, got overthrown, and that that finally saved him. And he's liberated, uh, as it turns out, by James Monroe, who arrives about a week after Robespierre had fallen as the American minister to France, and uh, he he didn't know that Payne was in prison. Uh, the Washington administration had not bothered to tell him that Payne was was in prison, which was which I found odd, because Washington had had very good relations with Payne uh, all through the revolution. Payne visited him at, visited him at headquarters on times. Washington got him a job or two. Uh, they had seemed to have a pretty close relationship, and and 
but Washington doesn't tell Monroe that he's that Payne is in prison, and, and Monroe learns that after he arrives in Paris and he pulls some strings and gets Payne uh, out of prison. That concludes part one of our interview with author John Furling about his latest book, Apostles of Revolution, Jefferson, Payne, Monroe, and the Struggle Against the Old Order in America and Europe, published this year by Bloomsbury. The interview was recorded at the Planners Inn in Savannah on September 13th. The hardest working engineer in show business, back for another year of punishment, now also the czar of our Tallahassee office, is Brendan Cannonball Crellin. Our mailman this week and every week is Crimson Tide fan extraordinaire, one Gary F. Taylor, born and raised, that's right, who is away this week attending the Heartland Pagan Festival in Tonganoxie, Kansas, but he'll be back next week. Our legal counsel this week and every week is provided by the law offices of Gallopo and Taylor, where their motto is, legal fees designed to fit our boat payments. Catering this week provided by Hagee's House of Tacos, home of Big Al's Locale, Pen Pal, Panama Canal, Blaze Pascal, Dick Vital, High Chaparral, OK Corral, L'Oreal, Don't Call Me Sal, Bad for Morale, Drippy Enchilada. If you have an iPhone, you can find our podcast at the App Store or on the podcast app on your phone. If you have an Android, please look for us at Google Play. Be sure and tell your friends and family because there's no sense in suffering through all of this alone. You can find out everything about the Georgia Historical Society at georgiahistory.com and the Georgia History Festival at georgiahistoryfestival.org. Please also check out my blog and similarly painful podcast at deatonpath.georgiahistory.com. If you have any comments about this show or about life in general, please drop me a line at sdeaton at georgiahistory.com. As always, thank you so much for listening. We hope you'll come back next week. So long, everybody.